Chapter 4, Sensation and Perception. Basic questions we're going to be addressing in Lecture 1. What's the difference between sensation and perception? What are the properties of light, and what aspects of visual perception do they influence? What are the roles of the cornea, lens, iris, pupil, and the retina, rods and the cones in particular, in the functioning of the eye? And then, how do we see in color? So take a look at this image. What do you see? Do the lines appear to be parallel, or do they appear to be not parallel? Answer is, they appear to be not parallel. However, we know, since it's a visual illusion, the lines are parallel. The sensory stimulus that we're processing is such that the lines are parallel. However, we perceive the image as having lines that are not parallel. So this visual illusion illustrates the fact that there is often not a one-to-one -one correspondence between sensory input and perception. The actual lines in the image are parallel. We perceive the lines to be sloped. So this begs the question, what is reality? If we're not sure that there is this connection between the actual thing out there and our perception of it, then what exactly is, is it that we're perceiving as the world out there? What is reality anyway? Now this is the question that we're going to get an answer to today, but we'll begin by suggesting that reality is really a construction. It's constructed through the joint processes of sensation, which involves the stimulation of our sense organs, such as our visual apparatus, and perception, which involves taking that information that's coming from our sense organs and piecing it together, selecting out of a complex environment that information that's pertinent to organize that information and to try to make sense of it. That's the processes of perception. So this joint process of sen sensing the world out there and then the perceptual process of piecing it together into what we hope is a pretty accurate rendering of what exactly it is that's out there. Through these joint processes, we can construct reality. So in your text, the lion's share of the chapter is dedicated to the visual apparatus, so that's what we're going to focus on in lecture. And we'll begin with light, since light is the physical stimulus for the visual system, we're going, to, we're going to talk about light a little bit. So think of light as a form of electromagnetic magnetic energy coming in, entering, entering our atmosphere from the sun, and artificial light generated through light bulbs and other forms of light generating technologies and so forth. Uh, without light, we wouldn't be able to see. So our visual apparatus depends on the presence of light. Light is measured in wavelengths and amplitude. So if you look at this image, think of amplitude as the distance between this peak and this trough. Think of wavelengths as being the distance between the beginning of this waveform and the beginning of this waveform. So we can measure light both in terms of wavelengths and amplitude. So those properties of light are associated with particular sensory or perceptual phenomena, which we'll talk about in a minute. The human physical, visible spectrum is somewhere between 440 and 700 nanometers. So nanometers is the unit of measurement, and that's our limitation. There's other organisms that can see outside of that fairly limited range. For example, some creatures that hunt at night can see up here in the right hand of the the image in the infrared spectrum, so pit vipers and so forth, some kind of snakes and so forth can see in that uh, end of the spectrum. And then there's other creatures like honeybees that who could see down below 440 nanometers down in the ultraviolet range. So humans are limited to this fairly narrow band of 
light. That is, our eyes are prepared to sense light that uh, is composed of, uh, of those wavelengths. So the properties of light and their perception. So each of these properties of light, wavelength, amplitude, and purity, are associated with particular perceptual phenomena. And that's what we're going to talk about next. So let's start with wavelength. Wavelength is what determines color or hue. So you can see from this image that light of relatively short wavelengths is perceived as blue, and then light of longer wavelengths is pre perceived as red, and then everything in between. So short wavelength is blue, long wavelength is red, and then everything in between. So wavelength determines the perception of color or hue. So concept check for you, what letter best corresponds with red light? A, B, C, or D? Answer is A. Longer the wavelength, the more red the light is going to be. Amplitude determines brightness. So how high this peak the, or the greater the distance between these, uh, this peak and this trough, the higher the amplitude. So higher amplitude, the higher the uh, the greater the brightness. The lower the amplitude, the lo the the lower the brightness. Concept check: What wave below corresponds with bright blue? A. Low frequency, low amplitude. B. High frequency, low amplitude. C, low frequency, high amplitude. D, high frequency, high amplitude. Answer is D. So blue light is characterized by short wavelengths. Bright light is characterized by high amplitude. And then the last is purity. The purity of a color is determined by saturation. Right, so how pure a color depends on the ratio of a dominant wavelength to other wavelengths in the color. So what does that mean? Well, I'm going to use an analogy here. And what you're looking at there is the surface of the ocean. My sport is surfing. I've been surfing for 30 years. And so we're going to use a an example from oceanography, just sort of capture this, then we'll talk about what this means in terms of color and light. So in any different, in any given cross section of the ocean, you have swells coming from different directions of different wavelengths. So that's what you see here. Uh, in the center here, we have sort of this confluence of swells coming in from different directions of different wavelengths. So we have this long wavelength swell, we have this medium wavelength swell, we have another long, another long, another long, and another long. So the question is, in that little center chunk of ocean, what's the dominant wavelength in the mix? So you would just look at the ratio of one wavelength to the other, and it appears like there's one, two, three, four, five longs and one medium, so it's a five to one mix. So the dominant wavelength is long. So if you think of color as being determined by wavelength, it's the dominant wavelength in a mixture of light of different wavelengths that will have a greater impact on the perception of the color. So think of saturation and purity as being related, and it's the ratio of the dominant wavelength to other wavelengths in the color. So let's take a look at these three different colors. So yellow is around 590 nanometers, red 700 nanometers, green 540 nanometers. So if you look at this bowl, you can see that there's going to be much more yellow than red, red or green. So the dominant wavelength would be 590 nanometers with a lesser mix of light of different wavelengths. So this would be a predominantly yellow color. It wouldn't be pure yellow. It would be less than pure. 
So it would not be a totally saturated color. So greater the saturation, the purer the color. So in this image, we see as saturation increases, that is, essentially we're eliminating light of different wavelengths, the more the saturation increases. So at some point, we'd reach a point where it's just one light of one wavelength. In this case, it would be pure red is 700 nanometers. And there would be no other light of any other wavelength, so that would be zero nanometers. So that would be 700 nanometers to zero nanometers of light of other wavelengths. So that would be pure red. So uh, purity of a color is determined by how saturated the color is. So take a look at this color wheel. Which colors are the purest? That is, which colors are the most saturated, have the greatest amount of saturation? Answer is green, yellow, orange, red, violet, blue. So those colors are pure, whereas blue-green is a mixture. So let's take a look at the human eye. My guess is that you're familiar with some of these structures, but we're going to go over it. Uh, so this may be a review. So we're going to start from the front of the eye, work our way to the back. So at the front here, and we're going to look at the structures and their functions. We have the cornea, which is a tough membrane that serves as essentially a dust cover for the for the lens of the eye. But the cornea is this on the outer surface of the eye. And then let's move inward. We have uh, the iris, which is the colored portion of the eye. And that iris is controlled by muscles that will either expand or contract, uh, depending on the amount of light that is present. Uh, the, the dark hole that you see here, the dark spot that you see is the pupil. Uh, that pupil, the size of the pupil will vary uh, depending on the amount of light that's present. So the iris essentially is like the aperture of, the, uh, of a camera. That is, if there is uh, dim light, there's not much light, then that iris will retract and the pupils will appear to be much larger to let the maximum amount of light into the chamber of the eye. Uh, if it's very bright light, then that iris will contract and the pupils will be small. So the pupil isn't actually uh, a structure, but rather it's a window into the interior portion of the eye. And the iris contracts and expands, uh, making that pupil larger or smaller. And then we have the crystalline lens back here. The role of the lens is to uh, position the image on the retina, which is on the back of the eye. We'll talk about that in a second. But the lens uh, functions through accommodation. That is, there's muscles that surround the lens that flatten it out and squeeze it. And the idea is that when we look at objects of varying distance from ourselves, then that lens will... Uh, expand and contract, it will accommodate to best position the image on the back of the eye. So the role of the lens could be said to focus the image on the back of the eye, to best position the image on the back of the eye. So in the interior of the eye, you have a very gelatinous substance known as vitreous humor. And then on the very back of the eye, you have a very, very thin membrane known as the retina. And we'll take a look at a close-up image of the retina in a second. But uh, the role of the retina is to process that uh, sensory stimulus. A couple things about the back of the eye here. We have what's called the fovea. And the fovea is a part of the retina that has a uh, the greatest concentration of a particular kind of neuron known as a, a cone. And the concentration of cones at that part of the eye is so great that uh, images positioned right on the fo fovea are going to be seen with great acuity, uh, very high definition. Whereas if you position the image somewhere away from the fovea on the 
uh, peripheral of the, the retina here, then you're going to experience a decrease in visual acuity. And then, again, we'll look at the cells of the retina in a minute, but those cells are uh, neurons and they have axons, right, that bundle up and form a, a nerve known as the optic nerve, and then that optic nerve exits the back of the eye. Uh, one more structure I want to mention is the optic disc. Uh, the optic disc is where the bundle of, of axons exit the eye, and it's known as a blind spot because there's no cells there that will respond to light. So here's a close-up of the retina. There's a number of different cells. The two that I want us to pay attention to are the rods and the cones, so named because that's the way they're shaped. Think of the rods as functioning primarily in peripheral vision and in night vision. Think of the cones as functioning primarily in day vision and color vision. You'll read about structures that are in the brain between the, the eye and the visual cortex, which is at the very back of the brain. Uh, certainly read about those, but I, what I want you to know for now is that uh, most of the processing of visual information takes place in the visual cortex, and that's an area back here in the back of the brain. And that's where we piece together that visual information that we're acquiring via our senses so that we get what we hope is a pretty accurate image of what the world is out there. Whatever it is out there uh, that our senses are detecting. So a little concept check about some of these structures. And let's start with A. That portion of the eye is known as the iris. How about B? That is the crystalline lens. How about C? That would be the pupil. D, that would be the cornea. And E is that thin membrane called the retina that has the rods and the cones. So concept, concept check that ties what we're talking about today into what we covered in Chapter 3. So your task is to name that lobe. Where is the visual cortex lo located? We talked about the four lobes of the brain in the section on the biobasis. What lobe is the visual cortex located in? So it's way back here, and that would be the occipital lobe. So a little summary here, basic processes of human vision. We begin with light as the physical stimulus for vision, so that light energy enters the eye, and then it is transduced by receptors in the retina into neural impulses. So this is a kind of amazing process where the eye is designed to take energy of one form, that is, it's designed to take light energy, photons, and transform those photons into neural impulses, those little sparks of energy. Two, the neural impulses are then processed in retina and in the brain. So we're designed to make sense of that data. Three, depending on a number of additional factors, such as context, so I've got context, context in white here, just to suggest that the context in which we view something will often in influence what we see. So if I had the word context in sort of an orangish brown, it probably it would be less visible than if I had the font color in white. So there's a number of different factors that influence what we ultimately see. So I want to talk a little bit about color vision. And this, you can imagine, is a question that child would ask you, maybe your little niece or cousin or son or daughter. Why is the sky blue? It's a beautiful day. You're looking up and the sky is incredible color of blue. And the little person asks, why is the sky blue? What would you say? What would you say? Here's an answer. Probably not, not a very satisfactory one, but 
it's actually the case? The answer would be it is not blue. Now imagine that little person would be get would be kind of frustrated with that answer, but that is technically what's going on. It is not blue, but rather color is a perceptual phenomenon. There's nothing about any object, whether it's a sky or or a colored piece of clothing. There's nothing about color that is an inherent property of the object, but rather it's a purely perceptual phenomenon. So I want to spend some time talking about how we see in color. Most color vision begins with light being reflected or refracted from objects, that is gas molecules and water droplets in the atmosphere, uh, pigments and dyes and paint, reflecting light of particular wavelengths back to us enters our eye and then we piece that information together and perceive color. So most color ref is composed of light of different wavelengths. One of the first theories of color vision was the trichromatic theory or the young helmholtz theory. And young helmholtz proposed that our eyes contain three different types of receptors that are designed to respond to three specific wavelengths of visible light. That is, the short wavelength or blue cones, the medium wavelength or the green cones, the long wavelength or the red cones. Now, Young and Helmholtz weren't aware of the presence of cells in the eye known as cones, but rather they predicted accurately, actually, that we're prepared somehow or another to be responsive to light of these three wavelengths red, blue, and green. And it's through the combination of these three colors that we can perceive any color in the spectrum. So we see the world in color due to the combined effect of red, blue, and green receptors responding different, differential, differentially to light of those wavelengths. So. I'm going to use an example of the old uh, cathode ray tubes or the old color televisions. If you look really closely at those screens, you'll see that the, 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 the images that you see are pixelated. That is, they're made up of little uh, red, blue, and green triangles. And it's through the combination of these colors that every color can be created. And that's how the old color TV works combination of light, red, blue, and green. So that seemed to make sense. That seemed to explain how we see in colors, that we have these uh, receptors in our visual apparatus that are selectively designed to respond to light of different wavelengths. Some problems with trichromatic theory. So some of the research was subjective in that uh, research participants were asked to uh, look at a color and then try to describe that color or create that color subjectively using red, blue, and green. And people struggled with this and most of the time the color that they reported needing, this fourth color, was yellow. So people subjectively, perceptually have a problem recreating all these colors with just red, blue, and green. Seemingly we need a fourth color. That's our sense. Trichromatic theory also could not explain what are called complementary after images. So I'll show you one in a minute, but I just want to explain what these are initially. So complementary colors. In color theory, complementary colors are colors that yield neutral tones. That is gray or white or black when mixed together. So when we mix pigments, red, blue, and green together, and so forth, we're going to get black. When we mix light, red, blue, and green light together, we're going to get white. Uh, in perceptual models, that is our subjective sense of color. And uh, the color wheel down here is a perceptual model. Uh, we perceive some colors as going together, uh, red and green, for example, blue and yellow. black and white. What a complementary after image is, is when you stare at one color for an extended period of time and then you look away at a white screen, you're going to see the uh, complement of that color. So, for example, if you stare at green, 
and you look away at a white screen, you're going to see red. If you stare at yellow, you're going to see blue. If you stare at black, you're going to see white. So let's take a look at a complementary afterimage. So stare at the white circle in the center of the flag. What you should see is the American flag. Now let's do that again. Stare at the white circle. All right, so hopefully you got that complementary after image. So the question is, why would we see, after looking at green, black, and yellow, why would we see red, white, and blue? According to young Helmholtz theory, we, sh we should see the same colors. If those uh, sensory organs are being stimulated uh, with red, or excuse me, with green, black, and yellow, then we should see, continue to see red, or excuse me, we should continue to see green, black, and yellow, but we don't. We see red, white, and blue. So like any good theory, it has its limitations. All good theories are limited to some extent, and this was an, a limitation of the young Helmholtz theory, which presents opportunities for others to come along and say, well, I think uh, this may be what was going on. We need to uh, expand or extend our theorizing a bit. And so opponent process theory is that extension. So po opponent process theory explains why we see complementary after images. So what opponent color theory suggests is that there are three opponent receptive channels, channels that respond in antagonistic ways to each other. So we've got neural pathways in our visual system that respond antagonistically. So that is, if I stare at green and perceive green, then at that point, red is being suppressed, such that when I look away and that stimulus is removed, it frees up red to be expressed. Same thing with yellow. If I stare at yellow, then the channels that uh, result in the perception of blue are being suppressed. And then when I look away, when I remove that stimulus, now blue has the opportunity to manifest. So responses to one color of an opponent channel are antagonistic to those uh, other colors in the channel. So in this way, it's a very, very delicate dance that we do when we're perceiving in color. That is, to perceive one color, we have to shut down uh, the other channel, essentially. So reconciling the two theories. One thing we know is that the eye does have these different kinds of cones that are sensitive to light of different wavelengths. And, those, and that much we do know. There are also cells in the retina, the thalamus, and the visual cortex that respond in ways predicted by opponent process theory. They respond in antagonistic ways to each other. So really, it takes both the trichromatic theory and the opponent process theory to explain color vision. Here's a model of how color vision can be thought of as working. So it works in stages. At the initial stage of processing sensory information, we can think of trichromatic theory as operating. So in our retina, we have the cones that are prepared to respond to short wavelength light, medium, and long wavelength. And then farther back in the visual apparatus, the visual system works according to opponent process. And that, that information, once that processing do, is done, the information goes to the brain and is processed further in the visual cortex. So think of color vision as being the combination of both trichromatic theory and opponent process theory. Learning objectives that we covered in lecture one. We define sensation and perception. Describe the three properties of light and the aspects of visual perception that they influence. Describe the structures of the eye and their functions. 
describe the role of the cornea, the lens, the iris, the pupil, and the retina, focusing on the rods and the cones, in the functioning of the eye. Explain what complementary colors are and describe what a complementary after image is. Compare and contrast the trichromatic, that is the Young-Helmholtz theory, and the opponent process, the herring theories of color vision.